us uh, a couple things. Uh, let me steal a little bit of a uh, message time just for an announcement. I don't usually do this, but Wednesday night we had a fun occurrence. Uh, we're meeting in 105, and I know you have a busy week and life interrupts your schedule sometimes, but uh, God interrupted ours for a few minutes Wednesday night, and I just thought I'd take a brief time to just say, hey, if you have a chance to come on Wednesday nights, we've in the last couple months, we've been spending a lot of time breaking up and praying, but we're the next couple weeks, we're doing a kind of a series of Bible study. But before we got to do that, Janet Teff shared something, and then next thing you know, everybody's sharing something. So uh, those kind of times are rare when God interrupts our schedules like that. So I'd invite you to, to, to come. If you're so inclined to be open on Wednesday nights, we'd love to have you. Secondly, um, like we did last Sunday, I'd like for the, those of you that are here that are on the search committee, if you would stand. Uh, we we kind of got away from that, but if you're on the search committee and you're here today, stand up and for let's all stand you, now that you know who they are. And if you're here and around them, gather around them and let's pray for them real quick. Uh, not that we're in a hurry, but just want to lift them up uh, in these days as they're fulfilling their task and their role. So if you're so inclined, uh, without pushing them over, let's lay hands on them and pray for them, shall we? Let's pray. Father, we're grateful for this morning. Lord, thank you uh, so much, Father, for uh, your name being exalted above every other name. And that your name truly is great, and you want to display that in us and through us and among us. And so we're grateful for that. Pray that in the moments that we have that are precious each week together, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, I pray that you would continue to interrupt our schedule and and show up and, and remind us of the things that you're doing around us. Father, we have a, a group of individuals here as our search committee that are, are seeking your will and, and earnestly wanting to hear from you, to know exactly how to lead and how to guide and, and how to process. And the task is big, the journey's hard, but Father, you're faithful. And so as we surround these, our friends, we lift them up, pray that you give them the strength that they need. Give them the wisdom, Father. Uh, give it to them liberally. Help them to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that they're they're stepping and moving in the direction that you've called them to step and move. I pray that as they read resumes and hear stories and listen to people and, and check references, all the mechanics of that, Father, would not be lost in the fact that you have a heartbeat in someone who has a heartbeat for here. And I pray that they would discover that. Pray that we would be patient with them, that we would pray for them, that we would lift them up in anticipation of them doing their job into completion and bringing someone here. So thank you for your work there, and thank you for being among us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so some of us in this room have not taken a test other than your driver's test in a long time, right? I mean, you know, we, high school for a few of us have been uh, many years ago, college many years ago. So t- the idea and concept of taking a test can be foreign to you. But the whole thought about tests, it might be a little bit scary for some, is that tests mean that you either pass or fail, right? So there's just this level of uh, intensity about them that makes us all a little bit uncomfortable. I remember there was a young man uh, that used to go around to youth groups back in the 70s and 80s, and he had a little song about uh, the the prayer in school thing was really a big issue at that time as they were, people were beginning to take it away. He always said, as long as there were algebra tests and English tests and all the rest, there will always be prayer in schools, Right? So, um, but I want us to take a test today because where we're at in 2 Corinthians 13, it's going to be very applicable, but I want us to take a test. I want to give you a couple practice questions that are just a generic, no pressure, but th- these supposedly are known by a fifth grader. Just saying, okay? And this is the honor system. You don't have to raise your hand, but I need you to pick one. If you've got a pen or a, want to scratch, you can do it in your head, however you want to do it. But let's just start with an easy one. What is the fastest bird on foot? A, flamingo. B, penguin. C, emu. D, ostrich. Or E, turkey. Okay. How many think it's D, ostrich? Okay. How many had another answer they were willing to raise your hand? No, just kidding. Okay, I told you I wasn't going to do that. All right, so this one, uh, this one should be easy again. Fifth graders are supposed to know this. What planet is closest to the sun? A, Venus. B, Earth. Uh, C, Mercury. D, Mars. E, Jupiter. Is it A, B, C, D, or E? 
with C, Mercury. Okay? A heptagon is a shape with how many sides? Four, six, seven, eight, or nine? A heptagon has how many sides? Four, six, seven, eight, or nine? The correct answer is seven. Very good. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see if I can trick you a little bit. Which of the following states is not on the Gulf of Mexico? Georgia, Texas, Florida, Alabama, or Louisiana? Georgia. Very good. All right. Uh, let's get a little bit harder here. What is the largest South American country by area? Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Mexico, or Peru? Brazil. Okay. How are we doing so far? Are you grading yourself right? Do I need to check up on your quiz? All right. Just a couple more, and then we're going to get to a serious quiz. All right. Which of the following states is not part of the Four Corners? Now, if you don't know the Four Corners, you might, this one might really trip you up. New Mexico, Utah, Colorado, Nevada, Arizona. Which one is it? Nevada. Correct. Who was the first, in, first person to step foot on the moon? Was it Edwin Buzz Aldrin, John Glenn, Sally Ride, Alan Shepard, or Neil Armstrong? Neil Armstrong. That's easy. Easy. Okay, Inca civilizations were con concentrated on what continent? Central America, Africa, North America, Asia, or South America? South America. Okay, and last but not least, what state is the Grand Canyon in? <laughs> is it California, Arizona, North Dakota, New Mexico, or South Dakota? Arizona. Okay, so we did pretty good on that. Everybody's got a fifth grade reading level here. Okay, so it's, it's, that was just a fun exercise to get our brain working, all right? So let's do one that's a little bit different. Let's do a Bible quiz, okay? So I want you to answer this one. And again, we're on the honor system. This is a Bible quiz. The fruit of the tree of knowledge in the Garden of Eden was A, an apple, B, a pear, C, a pomegranate, or D, nobody knows. Very good. Now this one's really tough. Jonah was swallowed by A, a whale, B, a shark, C, a squid. A whale, okay. All right. Who was king when Jesus was born? Pilate, Herod, Caesar, or Barnabas? Herod. Hey, we're doing good. God created man in his own A, time, B, image, or C, way. Okay. How many books in the Bible? 35, 48, 62, or 66? We've got some Sunday school people here today. All right. What happened to Paul on his journey to Damascus? He argued with Barnabas, lost his sight, or met with the apostles? Lost his sight. Who was the mother of John the Baptist? Sarah, Mary, Elizabeth, or Anna? Okay. Did anybody miss that one? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, who was killed by being struck in the forehead with a stone? A, Samuel, B, David, C, Saul, or D, Goliath? Um, the Ten Commandments are found in which books of the Bible? Genesis and Matthew, Exodus and De Deuteronomy, Joshua and Isaiah, or Acts and Romans? Okay. The Pentateuch is... You sure it's not the instructions for observing the Sabbath? You're right. First five books of the Old Testament. Who found a swarm of bees and honey inside the carcass of a lion he slew? Anybody other than... Samson? We, are we okay with Samson? That's who it was, Samson. Okay, so that was a nice little test. Kind of test your, your Bible knowledge, if you will. And, okay, we can have fun. And I would say everybody gets an A. I'm grading on the curve, right? Everybody gets an A. But think about that for a minute. If you, how do you measure something as tangible as your faith? How do you know that you've, you're, you're where you need to be on your journey and in your relationship with Christ? What measure, what questions could we ask that would say, you're where you need to be, you're exactly doing what God's wanting you to do, you, you're, you're, you're in the fullness of as God designed you, you're, you're getting there. How do you know that? Or is that even relevant or important? How about this? Are you a Christian? How do you know? What test do you take that says, I'm a Christian. We just did a little fun IQ test, but you know what? The Bible tells us that, that you know, that, that um, 
scriptural knowledge that, that the enemy knows. The, when, when, when Satan t- tempted Jesus, he used what? Scripture. So is that how you know? You think about the, the, the mature, how you know that you're spiritually mature. And is it even a, an issue? So let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 13. And we're going to spend some time in 5th on 5 and 6. Paul has been having this lengthy conversation that we've been looking at for many, many, many weeks. And he's having this lengthy conversation with a group of believers, and he's, he's winding down his letter, and listen to how he talks to them in verse 5, 5 and 6 of chapter 13. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in you, unless, of course, you fail the test? And I trust that you would discover that we have not failed the test. That's a fascinating concept for most, to examine ourselves, to test yourselves, to see if you're in the faith. We don't think about that very often. I don't know if it's because it makes us uncomfortable or we just take it for granted or because we're here we all go, oh, he's a believer or she's a believer. But it's a fascinating concept. That word examine, for example, there's a definition of it. It, it, To inspect someone or something in detail to determine determine their nature or condition, i.e. to investigate it thoroughly. So what Paul is saying is, I want you to investigate yourselves thoroughly in detail. I want you to look at it in the minute, microscopic, down to the very basic level and say, are you in the faith? Are you in the faith? Are you a Christian? Do you trust Christ? He says, examine yourself. Look at it closely. Now, it's a funny thing to be real. It's a funny thing to to look at something that's real versus something that's fake. So one of my coworkers, Lindy, she's a second-year fellow there at the center. And uh, I walked by her desk the other day, and she had this really high-dollar speaker uh, system for her computer, iPod, uh, iPhone, the whole nine works. And we don't pay them anything. They're, they're second year fellow. She's a second year fellow, so she's getting her master's in business. We pay for that as a scholarship. We pay them a small stipend and work them about 30 hours a week. And I know her to be a very conservative young lady. And I go, Lindy, you bought that? Because it's several hundred dollars here in the States. And she started laughing. And I said, what? She said, look at it closely. So I looked at it, and I'm not really familiar. I don't buy that kind of stuff. So I was like, eh. Well, come to find out, Brandon, one of our other co-workers, had just returned from China, and rather than spend the $200 plus that we would have to spend to buy that article here, he bought it to her for $5 in China. (laughs) It looks real until you examine it closely. You see what happens, the the little jagged edge, the little trademark even is there. It's just off. It's off just a little, but it's a forgery. It's a fake. It's not real. Perhaps you've seen fake Rolexes. Got a friend that owns one of those. He loves to tat it out and do it. It actually works. He has to change the battery regularly. I don't think they have to do that on a real Rolex. But he's got one. But unless you stare at it long enough and really put it up next to the real McCoy, you may miss the fact that it's a fake. It's not real. And sometimes when we're examining ourselves, we're tempted to look at other people. But really what Paul's saying is look at yourself. Look at the details. The attention to detail and what's going on in the very small aspects of our life that we often overlook or ignore will tell us whether or not we're in the faith, whether or not we're real, or whether or not we're a forgery. Margaret went to China several years ago and bought me a North Face jacket, and it was my favorite jacket for about two weeks, and then the zippers broke, (laughs) you know? But what was interesting about it, the only difference between it and the real one was the R was off. So it said North Face, but the R was off, but it was a fake. Things that we think um, are real sometimes are fake, and I think things that Paul was seeing in the life of the Corinthian church at that time, he's saying, you're fake, you're not real. Examine yourselves. Look at it for yourself. Touch it. Notice the details. He's challenged them to ignore the status quo and really examine their lives, perhaps for the first time, and say, Are you redeemed? Are you real? 
Take a good look. Because just, the, just because you hang around people that are Christ followers, just because you do the religious exercises that we've come to, to, to like and, and trust, doesn't really mean anything in the big scheme of things when it comes to our heart. Knowledge and appearances aren't enough. Knowledge and appearances aren't enough. We, seven, we see lots of evidences throughout the scripture of this. Let me tell you two stories that come quickly to mind. How about you remember the man lying on the side of the road? He's been robbed and beaten on his journey, and he's laying there, and people pass by. And the first two were very religious. In fact, one of them was a person of the cloth, a preacher. And what they do? The Bible says they pass by on the other side. He's laying there, battered, bruised, beaten, and needs significant help. Who does the Bible say comes to help him? The good Samaritan. You bet. Someone who had no reason to stop, who culturally shouldn't stop, stopped and addressed the needs of this person when the people who from all the outward evidences were righteous people, they didn't do it. They were phonies. They were fake. They weren't real. And we can, we can get caught up in doing some of those same exact things practices where we we think that our Sunday school attendants are perhaps checking the box that I read my Bible every day this week would speak volumes and tell me yes I'm a I'm a I'm a Christ follower and Paul says you better watch out because that that's not the test how how about the Pharisee the story of the Pharisee and he goes in to pray and he's doing his weekly praying right because that's what religious people do they go to the temple and pray The Pharisee knew his scriptures. He observed the law. He practiced the law. He did what he was supposed to do from the religious perspective, very faithfully. Then he goes down to the altar and he starts praying. He looks over and sees this guy over there and he's he's prostrate before the Lord, begging God's mercy and forgiveness. He says, oh God, I thank you I'm not like that sinner. And what did Jesus say? Who went home justified that day? The guy who fell before his, on his knees and said, God, I need you. I desperately need a visit from you today. I am wrong. I am in sin. The righteous, religious person missed it. Those are just two of the many examples in the scriptures where we say, hey, from the outside, wow, they've got it. But that wasn't good enough for Paul. Paul says, look closely. How do you measure up? What about your life reflects that you are rightly related to Christ? What behaviors can other people observe that says, wow, there's something different about that person? Galatians 6 says this. This is Paul again writing to another church. He says, each each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else, for each one should carry their own load. He says, test yourselves. I don't have to compare myself to Billy Graham. I don't have to compare myself to the worst sinner in the world. I have to compare myself to what God has done for me, the grace that he's given me and that I desperately need and can't exist without. The test is my relationship with Christ, not the way I look to other people in terms of my religious standing. We are responsible to, to be so rightly related with Christ that, that we give evidence to the non-believing world around us. We give evidence, not lip service, but that they see a difference. I can remember in the 70s a song that said, the world will know the tomb is empty when they see our hearts are full. We've allowed the enemy to, to challenge our discourse and to change the discussion to, to that Christians look just like everybody else. The whole marriage debate, marriages, Christian marriages in just as routinely as non-Christian. Well, we, we've allowed that to happen. We, we, we are not living out the right relationship. And so, so Paul says, test yourselves. You're responsible for you, and you're responsible for your behaviors, and they, they should reflect a right relationship with Christ. That same passage in Galatians, uh, Paul says, you know, the whole spiritual standard, the, the sum of the law can be summed up in this. Love your neighbor as yourself. 
don't know the best stories of Scripture. Don't know all the, you don't have to memorize. You don't, you don't have to take a test every week to, of IQ knowledge and your Scriptures or, your, or what you believe about Reformation or Calvinism. Or, none of that matters in the big scheme of things. What matters is how are you doing with what God has given you? Are you loving your neighbor as yourself? Do they see a distinct difference in you? There's a direct correlation with our behavior that isn't necessarily religious practice, but is rooted in doing good and helping others and tending to the poor and giving them ourselves, of letting our finances honor God, of providing a helping hand. Paul is hoping that by close examination, by you really looking at the details of your life, where you spend your energy, where you spend your time, where you spend your money, those things should reveal the heart of the gospel in you. And the heart of the gospel is for the world and for everybody around us, loving your neighbor as yourself. So a couple things here. There are two descriptors. He says, examine yourself, look at the details, check it out, and then, which we've already talked about in detail. But then he says, test yourselves. So I ask you, I, I'm a little stumped by that one personally. How do you test what grid, what questions do you come up with that says, I'm going to test myself spiritually? What exactly does that look like? I think there's some of it that's about this. It's what about your faith that requires energy, money, time that you don't know or don't have or don't think you have? What, about your, what is your faith requiring from you? Paul says, I carry around the scars on my body as evidence of my faith. That's what he tells the Corinthians. I, people can see the physical scars on my body from my being rightly related to Christ. And that while none of us in America are physically beaten on a regular basis because of our faith, what, what are we carrying on us that proves to the non-believing world that we're rightly related to Christ? Why in the world would they have any questions from us if they don't see any difference from us? So perhaps it's, what about your faith requires energy? What about your faith requires more money, time, that you don't have or don't think you have? How does your faith, here's, the, here's another one that is possibly the answer to that. How does your faith challenge or change your daily habits or routine? What about your relationship with Christ causes a distinct behavioral detour in how you behave? Or how you live? Or the things you say? What does your faith challenge or change in your habits? I had a guy that worked for me for many years that loved Jesus and would come in and tell me about it every day. He chain smoked. Didn't have a penny to his name. And he'd buy a carton of cigarettes and smoke them. There was never one that wasn't in his mouth. Now some of you that smoke in here, you're going, hey, you're stepping on toes. Well, th th there is some of that. But the reality was he missed out on something. You know what he was telling me? That God was big enough to redeem him, but God wasn't big enough to change him. And if God is not interrupting your 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 routine, your habits, what does that say? And Paul says, examine yourself. Test yourself. There ought to be a significant difference in your habits. Have they been radically altered because of your relationship with Christ? So I think he's given us over the last couple of weeks incredible insight to what a behavior becoming of a believer looks like and doesn't look like. So he says, so test yourself. This is the end of this lengthy discourse he's having and he said look I've given you I've told you what it looks like I've told you how the faith fleshes itself out it's not about knowledge it's about walking every day in God's grace remember what Jesus says let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father in heaven not hear what you have to say don't let your light so shine so you can beat everybody in the Bible trivia. It's let your light so shine that they can see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. God knew. He, he, he indwells in us with His Spirit and it's supposed to be this bright light of fullness. And we walk around with mopey-dopey attitudes and act just like everybody else and then go, how come God's not moving in my, my work life? How come my friends can go every day and not be interrupted with their life by what God's doing? Let your light so shine before men that they see your good works and glorify the Father in heaven. So we started with the Bible IQ test. 
I don't have a simple test to verify your right standing with God. I wish I did. But Paul says to test yourself. And the key there is the results should be overwhelming. The results should be overwhelming. So a couple final questions. If you test yourself, first of all, are you in the faith? Have you trusted Jesus really and truly? Have you, have you come to the place where you realize for the first time, perhaps, that you said, hey, I desperately need a father. My sin is so great I could never pay it. And you realize the work that Christ did for you on the cross, and you go, yeah, I, 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 that's me. Are you in the faith? Secondly, if you're in the faith, how do people know? Is your, ref- is your faith setting you apart the way the inherent truth of the gospel and the relationship with Christ in our lives should do? Is it changing you? Is it shaping you? Is your, are your habits different? Is your speech different? Is your pocketbook different? Because Paul says, we are in a test, and I'm giving you the opportunity to test yourselves. Are you in the faith? And if so, how do people know it? Let's stand and pray. If you're one of those that perhaps here say, I'm not 100% sure about that, we'd love to talk to you about it. We'd love to engage that, have that conversation with you. Perhaps you're here and you say, you know, I remember making a decision many years ago, but I haven't really done anything with it. Perhaps you've never been baptized. We'll give you the opportunity to do that. Uh, Come down. We'll, We'll be glad to talk with you. Uh, and walk that through you with you. Perhaps you're here and you're not sure. Uh, you know you're sure of your salvation. You know you've been saved. You know you've had this integration of God's spirit in you, but you've not really let your light shine the way you should. Respond to the gospel the way only you can. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful.